Hi there, I'm Ryan Rivas, publisher of Borough Press, and you're watching a sneak peek at Little God, a book of poems by Avni Vyas, which we're publishing in October of this year, 2021. Little God explores family, diaspora, grief, loss, and landscape. In the wake of a miscarriage, a speaker looks outside of herself for a sign. In looking through her past, the figure of Little God arrives to shapeshift grief into self-knowledge. But unlike benevolent deities who receive prayers and bestow blessings, Little God offers faulty insight and callous love. These poems negotiate finding one's place in the world and the courage to leave that place. About the poet, Avni Vyas is a poet living and writing in Florida. Her poetry and nonfiction can be found in journals such as Grist, Meridian, The Pinch, Juped, Crab Orchard Review, Rigorous Magazine, and others. She's the essay editor at Honey Literary and the poetry editor at The Offending Adam. She teaches in the writing program at New College of Florida. And now please enjoy the opening poems from Little God by Avni Vyas. This first poem is called Little God Speaks Dog. At first, you smell like plastic bags and stale cardboard, a sad sweat older than you, rose, pepper. When I smell you again, I can suss out your mopes. My jaws clamp it. It's in your arms. Your legs snake with it. And for a few days, your skin blossoms with tender spots. You're sad. I killed it. But your smell shifts. Clay. Grubs. I watch the blues climb out of you to eat the sun. I watch it grow. I snap the necks of what sprouts in your garden, lest it remind you of the unsun. The night, invaded by white heads glowing on iron stakes, or after we trek for miles until you smell like yourself, and I want to lick it off you, be your rain, want to breathe you, grow you, madden, toughen, spin you, please smell how much I want to be alive with you. The rest of these poems are untitled and You'll understand why when you get a sense of the speaker. Today, I love the little God who begets fragments of the time in workshop when William held his hand, hovering, pledging for two whole sentences as he spoke of his beloved before noticing us watching. Of Ikalavya slicing off his thumb as an oath to never best his guru. Of prestidigitation a word I could rattle in my mouth's cage for an hour, of weighted blankets, of a coach's twang caroming in my head for 200 meters, of your silver hoops, how when you'd flick the left one and a high E would ring out like a dropped glass, a shriek. Today, the god drains his offerings, a shot of rum, a mineola tangerine, an almond, but resists being slaked. Light vaults into the pond past the mass of fish nests where minnows shimmer in small blades. The god asks why I am so slow to forgive, why I hold unmelted your old rock. Are you helping, the god asks, the atoms unearthed? He slaps his tiny, god-sized knee. Are you helping? Tears of laughter rolling now. Anything at all? Today, that little holy god scrap trampled my bras and chewed apart my underwear in a prayer-sanctioned assemblée, a numbskulled namaskara, tatta arav bharatnatyam from before. In tatters, I chase him, my body useless, a soft bell with no clapper. And he was delighted. The little god wants to make words. He demands to know why, when I flip the magazine to a page of a bright green lawn and add for fertilizer, why in all his days haven't I ever taken him there? He interrupts himself with a parade of ants, a thread the god follows, ribboning from room to room 
blessing the creatures and their shadows that bob up through a crack in the wall. The godlet contemplates leaving. You would miss me too much, he says. You'd live off of saltines and boiled peanuts. Ugh, your claws. I'll stay. The little god suggested not so gently, even his snores are a windy season, that the difference between gods and demons is where you let a spirit live. Why, are, why fairy fire to hell, he asks. Then can you bring some for me? Fire, I ask. No, hell. I conjure a bowl of heartbreak. The first shoots from our garden bed a jar of cardamom jam, the cufflinks you are too ashamed to love. I tell the god how you fill up a doorway, presuming solitude, and the cat escapes under the house like a tawny flame, and I chase after her on all fours. Let there be wars, the god wheezes, and I emerge, clotted cobwebs intact, glaring. Little wars! the cat's mouth devoid of lizards, eyes wild and moony. You wanted to leave her out, let her kill some. You're not off the hook, the god reminds me. You're the one who loves washing the dead. Thank you. Thanks, Avni, that was amazing. Um, it's great to hear them as uh, in addition to like having seen them on the page so many times, there's just like, as always, with readings, a whole other dimension. Um, and I'm gonna ask you a few questions to acclimate our viewers with the book a little bit um, and make them wanna buy it even more. Um, so the, the poems, as you mentioned, don't have titles, uh, or at least most of them don't. So can you talk about that choice and how the poems are otherwise linked thematically? Sure, thank you. Um, so the dynamic across the book of the poems, it's um, there's like a narrative dynamic. There's a singular speaker and then there's this figure of little God. So the untitled poems um, come from the voice of the speaker. And then the moments when little God talks back, uh, I decided to give little God sort of a stage. So little God gets a title and will begin or end a dialogue. But um, sometimes little God will talk in conversation with the speaker. Um, but I wanted to leave those poems untitled because they're almost like an epistolary or like a record of their conversation. So they kind of read almost like journal entries in some ways. Um, and I think the poems read a little more fluidly that way. And you know that it's the speaker talking in those untitled ones. And then when there's a specific break or a specific title, uh, that's where Little God kind of gets to occupy the stage. And in addition to, you know, the, the sort of layout of, of the different poems and the titles and whatnot, there's custom illustrations in the book that Mimi Serbisova did. Um, and so what was it like working with Mimi on the illustrations and how did that link happen and how did it all turn out? So Mimi is such a talent, like she's a polymath. She's so talented in so many different ways. Um, Mimi and I knew each other from, uh, before we had friends in common um, and I knew she was an illustrator and we had an opportunity to kind of, I was really interested in collaborating with her. Um, she draws a lot of inspiration from Florida and from uh, Florida fauna. And um, that, that was kind of a thematic uh, through line in these poems. And so um, one of the kind of magical things that happened about this collaboration was getting to share this really bizarre manuscript with an artist um, and letting it kind of occupy an entirely different visual language beyond my own imagination. So um, it was really exciting to have somebody with kind of their own relationship to Florida, their own relationship to um, sort of the magic and like the danger of how Florida really, you know, has these gorgeous, untamable animals and plants. Um, so Mimi's interpretations and her uh, interactions with the poems were entirely her own. And um, as she 
read the little god character, for her, the image of the ibis appear, uh, appeared again and again. So um, we talked a lot about like, you know, what does that symbol mean? How does that show up? You know, um, like we call them, you know, they're so common in our part of Florida right now. We call them pond chickens, right? Like they're sort of everywhere, but um, where I grew up in uh, North Florida, they're less common and they're, you know, water birds. So um, they're still like an exotic species as far as I'm concerned. Um, for Mimi, they represent a kind of resilience. Uh, they are, they're sort of like these uh, kind of tiny dinosaurs walking around us all the time. And so there's something kind of um, beyond us, I think, when these birds get invoked. And Mimi really took that image and, um, and used it as a way to explore this figure of little God who is at once everywhere, uh, can occupy any sort of shape, um, and, you know, arrives as a duck, as a manatee, as all of these different creatures over the course of these poems. Um, but, you know, we had such different visualizations of who Little God was. And so um, when Mimi introduced this idea of the bird, I was, I was so excited. It was beyond my own understanding. I wanted her to go with it. So um, working with Mimi, and Mimi's illustrations was really a way to open up these poems past, you know, like any kind of authority I felt I had over them. And it was um, really great to kind of like let somebody else take the, the language and run with it uh, and let their imagination go wild. So I'm just very, very thankful that we had that opportunity. And I'm so excited to for readers to get to experience those illustrations um, in tandem with the poems. Yeah, they're pretty stunning, along with the covers too. Um, oh yeah, front and back we, illustrations. Yeah, we we actually talked a little bit about um, you know Mimi's questions around the collection of poems, like who is Little God, where does this come from, how did you you know like picture this figure, and um, I I said like kind of in the most basic form, Little God reminded me of a brat, um, reminded me of sort of like a child Krishna who was just like very dissatisfied with everything. And um, and the image that again would come to mind was like a baby picture of me, like scowling. It's like my favorite picture of myself, like so mad. Like you're three years old, what do you have to be mad about? It's like everything. So um, uh, Little God uh, kind of <laughs> takes that sentiment in a different direction. And I think Mimi really enjoyed that interplay and um, did just some beautiful work uh, taking our conversations and bringing them to life. Yeah, I definitely get a sense of like childish wrath from some of the, the poems and, that are spoken by Little God. Um, so another interesting aspect um, of the book that the readers will get a small sense of in, in the introduction you wrote, but um, is that originally these poems were composed by hand ambidextrously. So one poem with the left, one with the right, kind of back and forth. Um, can you talk about that process and what you learned from composing this book that way? Yeah, so um, I'm left-handed and uh, I have always sort of carried that as a point of pride for whatever reason. I think when you meet other left-handed people, uh, you sort of like share in the woes of not finding, you know, scissors or like uh, smudging your own writing when you learn how to write. So uh, being left-handed was a part of my writing process, but it's always been really personal. So usually I journal by hand, uh, I take notes, I carry a notebook with me everywhere. So writing by hand is very much a part of who I am as a writer, but I don't um, compose poetry by hand anymore, not since I was a teenager. Uh, but for this project, I really wanted to um, kind of push beyond my own comfort. So um, something that I'll do periodically is like practice with my other hand. Um, one of the ways to think about it is uh, visual artists and musicians when they are considering the body as part of their practice or their instrument, um, it's not just a dominant hand, it's an interdependence that you're creating, right? So if like you're producing with the body, you're using, I mean, even as we're typing, we're using both of our hands, right? Um, so to really challenge what that interdependence was, I wanted to invite my non-dominant hand to speak in a, in a way. Um, and what ends up happening is like, I'm trying to develop my writing instrument. I'm trying to like figure out what role my body plays in producing poetry beyond just, you know, my brain, my hands and a screen. Um, so this was like a physical challenge. It slowed down my thinking and my producing, um, which was really scary. And 
I thought for a while that the hands would have different voices because they would be producing at like different rates. Um, but, you know, it's the same voice, but it's, you know, choosing different words. It's appearing differently on the page. There's um, a vulnerability to composing with your non-dominant hand where you uh, really have to kind of to respect the process of even producing text at all. So for me as a writer, it afforded a little more gentleness with myself in the process, uh, which I don't know if you talk to many poets, but we're probably not very nice to ourselves in our heads. Um, and so like, this was a really nice uh, way to kind of practice some of that on the page. Um, but what ended up happening was that these two different hands afforded like what I understand it, what I, what I understood happening over this book was a conversation. So, you know, like I'm starting one hand, this, you know, I'm throwing, I'm catching, um, it's, it's happening both ways. And uh, it, I know, it, I don't know if the reader can tell this, but it's, it's expanding my process. Um, so getting to compose ambidextrously invites a kind of gentleness that I was not used to in my writing voice. And um, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with it. Like, I don't know what happens to it now in the future. Yeah, it was fun reading the original manuscript, which was handwritten. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed that you were able to make sense of how that manuscript appeared on the page, because it really was like, it looks like it was composed by two completely different people, yeah. um, which was a little scary to send out into the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you told me about it. I asked for it. I got what I asked for, but I was delighted by it. And it's surprisingly, uh, or maybe not surprisingly, but it's legible. It's just wild, though, like to see the the two different handwritings, which there's a little sample of in the book for those who pick it up. Um, and I guess last thing I want to ask about is in addition to um, kind of having a, a different approach to this book by writing it ambidextrously and writing it by hand, um, it's also kind of a formal and stylistic departure from everything you've written before. So um, how, did, how did that happen? How is it different? And what's different about this book? So uh, most of the poems that I've written and published, you know, for the past decade tend to be a little more hermetic. They're, um, they come out of like, you know, a more grad school kind of tradition where you're in conversation with other poetic texts. You're um, thinking about like form and structure as these containers and shapes that are playing with the meaning that you're trying to make. Um, and by composing ambidextrously, those aren't really considerations that are at the front of your mind as you're writing. So in many ways, I had to put all of that stuff aside, all of that like training and learning and, um, you know, the fanciest, prettiest words, the, um, you know, like shiniest pirouettes or whatever, like it's, there was little room left for that. And so um, this was way more experimental in terms of its composition than I've, I've done ever. And um, I was, it's, there's like a, I, I was talking a little bit about the gentleness of that right hand um, coming in. And I think like you, I kind of saw it again um, as a departure from this like hermetic smart, um, like this, these types of poems that know exactly how to perform for an intelligent readership, whatever, you know, um, there, there really was no need for that with, with this collection where it was like, you know, these, these poems, these, this, these voices, uh, what do they want to say? How do they want to get it out? And that was sort of the most important part of it. So it really pared down the, um, the writing process and it was, it was risky, scary. Um, so again, it's one of those things where when you have a collection of poems like that, you're sort of sitting with something that looks a little bit like a monster um, or just like this wild animal that kind of came into your house somehow and you don't know how it showed up. And you're like, well, I could call animal services or I could like maybe give you some food or give you a bath and like see what happens and see if we like each other. Um, so I, I really like that, um, that, you know, these, this monstrosity becomes sort of like my best friend in a way. Um, and it just meant the world that I could like share them with a press that um, is, is excited about experimental writing is um, 
interested in sort of amplifying these voices. And so I think Borough Press is the perfect home for these poems. Um, and they really like, they were, I was very lucky to find a home at Borough uh, for this experiment and to really get to explore that. Um, so I'm just, they're, they're weird and I'm excited to see what happens next. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I think the luck is mutual. I feel like most of the book projects we do kind of happen through some stroke of, you know, serendipity or something. So it feels right.